So, people, we are here with uh, Mr. Freyet himself, who's going to talk about the 2PCP thing uh, from Synergy, which he worked on. And uh, I will uh, not fake any knowledge because I literally don't have any. I Wikipedia the AMP uh, earlier and, and, and looked at things and, and who played it and what makes it special. So I will uh, drill the man with some questions. But I really uh, hope that his vast experience in amplifiers tells us a little bit about it. So um, first, I'm going to say uh, uh, hello, Mr. Freyet. Good morning. Good day. Um, I'm in Los Angeles. You're in Germany. So whatever. Somewhere in the middle is... is. Uh... Yeah, I have to say that I messed up. And I know it's nine hours. I lived in LA for years. And somehow thought... It's at three today, even though my calendar said four, but four was wrong because it's actually, um, it was five. So I've been sitting here now for three hours waiting for this. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, two of those hours were my mistake. Um, and then, you know, it's early for you. So you had to like, you know, get up. So yeah, uh, I wanted to do other things today, but that's not happening. This is all that's happening today. So, let me look at my question number one. So, there's there's an amp from a company we're not mentioning because the fuckheads bought it. And we're not advertising for the fuckheads. Um, that's just how it is. I'm sorry, I'm not advertising for companies that are, you know, ethically on the wrong side. Um, so, apparently, I, I thought that amp, I don't know was like big in the early 90s or whatever. And I'm highly wrong about that. I looked at the timetable of, of amps and apparently that amp was built in 83 and only made for about, I think, a year. There aren't many of those out there. And is that correct? It was a transitional model. And uh, um, it came out, uh, the actual... Uh, Actually, it came out a little earlier than that. Um, the 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 two series started in around seventy nine, um, and then they started fixing fixing it into what it would eventually become. That's and that's what I read. There's the there was a two A two B then the two C, right. and actually apparently from the two C. What they did fix to the B was uh, the reverb, uh, effects level, and some clicking on the foot switch, which is when we're looking at a module, which is what we're doing, uh, has zero bearing on any sound on that module because it doesn't have a reverb or a foot switch or an effects loop. So none of the fixes from the B to the C would be reflected in, in what we have in front of us. But obviously what they did go into the plus and actually... It was very strange for me because the thing that I think of when I think of that brand is the EQ, which is also what I think of when I think of your brand. And then I just looked on Reverb and there are two of those, 2C P, 2, 2C plus, and they're 7,500 euro for a combo. Um And neither of them had an, an, an EQ. And I'm like, uh, what's that? And according to Wikipedia... The EQ is not what the plus means. The plus meant something else. Well, that's the problem with Wikipedia and history in general is it can be manipulated to, uh, <laughs> you know, reflect what the people who are trying to pr present it in a certain light would like it to be uh, 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 represented as. Um, so going to the actual root of the thing, the actual historical context, uh, part of the reason why I did the project is because that was all happening when I was learning more sophisticated amplifier chops. I basically knew how to refix things, but, uh, that my next level of um, uh, education in in 
repairing things and understanding tube amplifiers and then modifying things and then eventually building my own things. A lot of that, that was the, the working at Valley Arts was was like a, a supercharging, you know, um, of my knowledge base because there it was a, a prestige, prestigious shop. Uh, it was very busy. All the most well-known and busiest guys and women guitarists shopped there and got their stuff worked on there and um, found out what was the latest new thing in guitar and amp development there. Uh, so uh, I had to be a quick study. And at the same time, um, the Mark I had been out. I started working there in 79. The Mark I had already been out for a number of years. And um, <clears throat> it had a high input and a low input. And when people started wanting channel switching, um, the way you had to channel switch a Mark I was to have a little AB box. So you plug your guitar into an AB box. And then the AB box two outputs into the two inputs of the Mark One, and um, that's how you switched it. So one set of controls, and um, all of that extra cable. So it was kind of self defeating in that um, high frequency loss, noise, and switch popping. But it wasn't so bad. But it was it was there. And then if you put pedals in that, uh, you introduce pedals into the into the equation, which everybody was doing. We were building pedal boards like crazy. I had designed a power supply for pedal boards, and we were so we were making pedal boards with our own power supply, uh, and building them, custom building them for all these guys. And uh, so all of that complicated everything, and it got noisier, and the tone got funkier, and all of that, and we were coming up with a buffers. Paul Rivera had, had a buffer that he had designed, so we were using the Rivera buffer, and then eventually Valley Arts had their own buffer and that we were putting on the pedal boards or underneath the pedal boards so that you couldn't see them. And all these kinds of things, these were all, these weren't really sort of technical innovations. They were band-aids to fix all the problems that were caused by the scramble into the multi multi-faceted multi-feature amplifiers so um those were the early days we're talking the 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 the, the one the mark one came out in the early 70s so we're talking if, if i get this correct and I'm, i'm in no way anyone who knows about old amps at all but we're, we're just coming from an era where people cranked up 100 watt amps and killed everyone in front of them because they found mm -hmm. out that distortion then happens in the power amps were never designed to distort and then hendrix cranked it up and all of a sudden amps are starting to distort so we're just coming from an era where people are trying to make that in the preamp and actually manageable so multi-feature amps like you're saying this was the brand new thing with the mark one and obviously people hadn't figured out anything about this i mean probably effects loop wasn't anything that people were thinking of back then Right. Yeah, the effects loop was the the putting an effects loop in an amplifier was a was a big deal. That was like, oh, you can do that. Uh, yeah, we do it pretty much every day, and uh, um, so a lot of amps got effects loops installed. That was a, that was the hot thing. Um, like I said, when I started working at Valley Arts, this these developments were already underway, um, and. And then I had to do a few things. I had to get up to speed on that. I had to understand how to do it. I had to apply a lot of different uh, skill sets. You know, and you had to be able to do it. It had to be reliable. It had to look nice. You didn't want to butcher up somebody's amplifier. You could do it if you were. You could do butcher jobs if you were an independent guy working out of your house or something. But when you're working at Valley Arts and somebody well known brings an amp that they love into you and you do something to change it, it had better look pro, it better look good and it better work and it better sound good. And once you get a reputation for that, then 
and that's what that's what happened in Valley Arts was everybody just went there because you knew you could go there and get the right job done in a reasonable amount of time. And uh, it wasn't the cheapest, but it wasn't the most expensive. Uh, and some of the things that we were doing were expensive, but that's what those people needed. And they were working like crazy and they could afford it. So that's what happened. Um, uh, and the um, the Mark Ones, they were, you know, they were focused a lot on the sonics of it, you know, getting the sustain, maybe mainly the sustain. They were all really laser focused on sustain uh, and uh, the smooth overdrive. But mainly they talked a lot about the sustain. So they were doing things like um, experimenting with how much mid-range gain you were going to get. And they experimented with this device called the Fetron, which was just a little can with an FET replacement for a 12AX7. And they weren't trying to make it sound like a purist 12AX7. They were trying to get more gain and more mid-range. And the Fetron was um, a device uh, designed by a telephone equipment company for telephone equipment uh, for replacement of 12AX7s uh, ostensibly to reduce operating costs and increase reliability, reduce maintenance. So that device, one of its improvements in performance for telephone equipment was it made the, your voice clear because it accentuated the mid-range. And it just happened to be the kind of mid-range that worked for um, the development of of the Mark One in terms of getting more gain and more sustain, and they they realized that hey, the more mid range you get, the more sustain you get, because that's where uh, the frequency band is is easiest to get up there without uh, without causing other frequency problems. Like if you have too much bright gain, it gets too fizzy. If you have too much low in gain, it gets too rubbery, flubby. Uh, but mid range, you can you can just push that and get away with it. And that's what they did. And then they used the rest of the amp to try to fill that out. And that's where the EQ came in. Okay, now that we've got gain for days, now we have to massage it into something that is useful sonically over a wide variety of musical styles and sounds, not just mid-range. So that was where the EQ came in. And um, what, when did that come? It, was that already from the Mark One? It was in the Mark One, yeah. Okay. And yeah. It, apparently, from, I mean, there are clearly ones and twos and, uh, uh, and two A, B, whatever, with and without right. EQ. And apparently, that was something you could order with and without. But from what well, I've read, if that, that is yeah, in any way correct, the, that plus didn't here. that plus didn't mean EQ. The plus meant something else. Well, I'm getting to that. Yeah, okay. Because because the amps were custom made. So you could order them mm -hmm. with or without reverb, with or without EQ, uh, with two power tubes or four power tubes, you know, the, the, the 60 watt version, the 100 watt version. Um, and uh, so there was that. And then they made the transition to the two. Now, interestingly, they didn't really tell anybody that they were transitioning to the two. They just started shipping them they were developing it they were getting it uh nailed down and then they started shipping it now the way they worked was that it was about a six month lead time to get an amp so you paid a deposit 50 percent and then they put you on a list and they were building amps and so when your amp came up uh they would contact you and say okay send us the rest of the money we'll send you the amp and uh um so when you got the phone call you paid you got your amp boom you're done and um when they switched to the two you paid your money that you had ordered that, that you had to pay the deposit on for a mark one and you got a mark two well because and probably in their in their minds that was the same thing but better i mean 
Were they still yeah, selling hey, the one at right, that time? You're the, one of the lucky ones that just got one of the brand new ones that we just developed. Lucky you. It's a surprise. Woo. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, great. You plug it into it and like, wait, 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 wait a minute. What is going on with this? I hate this. <laughs> it, I don't like the sound. It's noisy. When I switch the channels, it makes this loud bang and all this stuff. And it just, there was a, an immediate backlash. Well, was, it that diff was it that different to the one sound wise? Oh yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was distinctly different. The overdrive stage was farther down the signal path on the mark one the overdrive stage was right in front in fact it was ahead of the first stage they dropped a triode gain stage in front of the existing input stage so it was like putting a two boost box in front of the input in between your guitar and the input jack essentially so that was an entirely different animal than uh, than an overdrive circuit being um, after tone controls, right? So that was the first thing. That was the mark. That was the mark two A, and uh, some people loved it. Some people absolutely hated it, and they immediately started dealing, learning what what uh, you know, high level, uh, high angst customer support was about because they were getting <laughs> it hard and they didn't have dealers at that time they uh or very few maybe one or two dealers in the whole country they were selling direct uh valley arts had a relationship with them uh because they were in such demand if anybody canceled their order mesa would send that amp to valley arts and we could sell it off the floor so Valley Arts had a waiting list for Mesas also, where people went to Valley Arts and paid a small deposit to get on this list. So if somebody canceled on a Mesa and it came to Valley Arts, you'd get a phone call from Valley Arts. Hey, we got the amp for you. And so we experienced the same thing, which was not only is your amp, did we get an amp in for you to come down and check out and buy, but it's the new Mark II. You're going to love it. And people would come down and go, that's not like the one that the other guy in my band has. That's his sounds great. This sounds that's this doesn't sound like that. What's <laughs> up? And um, and that was the problem with their rollout was they didn't set up anybody for the expectation that they're going to get something different. They just thought that they were going to get something you know slightly evolved and improved upon in in terms of function, but not in terms of sound. It was just like I want that sound. Where does that sound? And um, so when we started having people coming down to pick to check out the Mark II, it was like, ah, I, don't, I don't know what's going on here. And then uh, and then we started getting more calls from Mesa. Hey, we got another amp we're going to send down to you. And then a week later, hey, we got another amp before after a couple of weeks of this, we've got four or five in stock. And now we're going, uh, and, yeah, we got enough. We're good now. <laughs> yeah, and it's we we'll take amps, but maybe not that one. Yeah, or not that many. I, I mean, got, the the, the direct way, which is how I deal with companies, and say, you know what, it isn't great. I mean, but of course, as a dealer, maybe sometimes you want to keep the relationship positive, and you know, yeah. who, who's got the balls to tell someone like that? Say, well, you know what, you you, you made a piece of shit, make it better. As yeah, a reviewer, was, this is my daily stuff, but yeah, I mean... You're right. I, you had to sort of tread lightly. So yep, what, yep. what we were saying is, uh, that's great, um, but we've got three right now. Let's let's wait a week. And, you know, in a way, that probably helped them... Uh, that probably helped them launch the interest in having a dealer base because now they would need shops to take the rejects. I'm speculating <laughs> on that a little bit. But it was certainly happening in our store, and um, it's and definitely then, it's definitely very important information for people buying on the used market because I again have no idea about this history. And if I saw one and it said A on it, I'd be like A B C. Where's the difference? I I might go for it for like I don't know fifteen hundred bucks, and I'm actually buying a turd. I mean, because well, I literally yeah, would see ABC. I would see the amp, I would see the brand, I would say, oh great, old amp, I'm in. That might be a mistake. Yeah, the ABC thing was it was about 
uh, fix number one, fix number two, fix number three, mm-hmm. and uh, not a, not about which EQ or reverb, any of that. It didn't relate to that. It related to the various approaches to resolve the problems that people were coming back and saying, this isn't working right, this isn't working right. The primary thing that bugged people was that it that the the loud click that it made when you switch channels. Now, it didn't click when you weren't playing. It only clicked when you were playing. And if you were playing in overdrive mode, it clicked louder. And then click is being nice. It was a bang. Uh, and so it, cases, it was probably jump jumping levels, right? Was jumping levels yeah. and gain. And um and also in a little combo like that, you'd have an EV speaker, which has got a very high sensitivity. <laughs> uh, and a hundred watt uh a little combo like that has got a lot of headroom, you know, with six L6s and so on. You could actually blow an EV in that amp from the switch transient when sw- when you hit the channel switch button. The click from the relay, if you had the amp loud enough, just the click would pop the speaker. And then, then my question would be, because I deal with warranty issues and stuff like this if it happened because of that would that company back in the day take responsibility and switch your speaker or would they well, say well this- hoo, not our fault i mean it was clearly because of the faulty design but would they well, you could do warranty on that you could re- fortunately you could research that but yeah we're talking about an evolution here a, a, a high pressure short term evolution where everybody's got to learn how to manage this new thing that isn't really that, you know, before JBLs and twins, um, uh, you'd blow them out routinely and sort of, you know, Fender understood what was going on there and they had to set up a warranty uh, policy to deal with that. And, uh, but in this case, it was a lot more difficult to, um, to research because in a situation like that, course the manufacturer is going to say send us one so we can evaluate it look inside and see what's going on so they would take the speaker apart and they wouldn't see any overheating they wouldn't see a discolored voice coil they wouldn't see the normal things that you see from overloading a speaker they're just going to see a little tiny opening in the voice coil somewhere on the voice coil there's going to be a little place where it blew like a fuse and they'll be going, that's a transient. They're going to know what that is. And they're going to go, that's a transient response issue. Where did that come from? So then they'd have to go look at the amp and see what the amp is doing and go, oh, that relay is causing a transient event. Okay, that's not a manufacturing defect. Mesa, you're on your own. You replace the speaker to the customer. We'll fix them for you. But we won't warrant you that. And uh, so... You can imagine there's all kinds of stuff going on while all that is happening. And then uh, uh, and then they're coming and then people are also coming to terms with the new sound of the overdrive, which is different than the Mark one. And they're reacting to that by doing uh, tweaks to the circuit and being a warranty outlet and being a. Uh, face to face with all the guys that are starting to use these amplifiers and pro guys who want answers now. I've got five sessions today. Come on, guys. Um, uh, The pressure cooker was going. And so there was regular communication between our repair shop, primarily me, and the factory um, with new information every day. The factory's telling me this today. Oh, here's a new tweak that they're going to do to improve the overdrive sound. Um, here's another tweak that they're going to do to try to ameliorate the relay popping and um, and so on and so on and so on. So on a weekly basis, I, w- I was having regular communication with the factory about these things. What are customers, our artists are saying to us coming in the door that will be valuable to you when you're working on how you're going to resolve the next issue. And then they're giving us things well, to, to try. Here, try this, try that. Yeah, but that's great. And, I mean, that's how it's supposed to be. They yeah. were in the loop with what the customers were experiencing and you as a repair tech, were tell- they weren't 
arrogant in a way saying, okay, we're on it, shut the fuck up. Uh, it, there was this two-way, actually three-way communication with the customers. Th that's how you improve a product. That's the only that's way to do it. And, and they were really conscientious about that. And they were really interested in the feedback that, that we, we gave them too. Am I, am then, I getting this right? Just to, to, to clarify, on the Mark, did, did you say that on the Mark 1, the drive was behind the EQ? Did you drive, say that? Because, be, because, was, you, uh, because you said on the Mark 2, uh, they changed where the, where, where the game was created. Is, is that correct? Yeah, they changed the actual stage in the in the train of in the signal path where the overdrive stage was in on the mark one it was in front of the input stage so in effect like an add-on distortion pedal between the guitar and the input oh, okay they had a stage in between the input and the input <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm trying to understand. But um, then on the Mark II, it was the way that now it's actually done on all the amps, right? That's right. Okay, right. and people were just not used to the sound because different is, I mean, that's such a guitar player thing. Different is not good. <laughs> when, different is only good if it's, different is only good is if it blows you away when you first hear it and go, I love that. What happened? Yeah, so, so they went different, but they didn't, they, they didn't do it right yet. <laughs> Yeah, there's going to be two reactions to innovation. I love that. What did you do? Or I hate that. What did you do? <laughs> yeah, okay. And with these subtle little uh, modifications of the Mark One that were going on, we would get the uh, the same thing. You know, somebody would be used to their amp. They're just getting to be really at home with it, and it's working for them and stuff. And then the factory, you know, being aware of certain guitar players and having some clout, you know, and that they're going to, or their endorsements, uh, they have a relationship with so-and-so and they'll tell them, Hey, we got a new tweak for your Mark one that you're going to love. And the guy comes down to Valley Arts and says, Oh yeah. Uh, the, uh, the factory contacted me and they said that there's a, there's a modification that, uh, that I need to have. And it's going to be really cool. So you're going to do that. Now, yeah, we got the call. We've got, I've been expecting you. All right drop it off, you'll have it in a couple of days. And the customer comes and picks it up a couple of days later and they go to a rehearsal or a gig and they call back and they go, what did you do to my amp? It sucks now. And it would be such a subtle little difference, a little tiny thing, but the guy's going nuts over it. And um, put it back, put it back, put it back. And well, now I'm, in the learning curve of dealing with customer reactions to changes by by virtue of being there so now what's happening is i have to document everything i do because up to that point i was just following the the the, the edicts from the factory changes for sister changes for sister blah 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 and i'm going okay 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 and then the customer comes back and I hate it, put it all back to stock. And like, well, you know what? I don't know. I don't remember what stock was because I didn't really take notes. I just did the update that the factory told me to do. So let me contact them and find out what it takes to get it back to the previous version. And I'll do that. No problem. I call the factory and they go, well, they were going through so many of these trials all the time that they weren't taking really great notes either. So I couldn't give them the serial number of that amp and they could say, oh, yeah, put X resistor back to X and X capacitor back to X and you're done. They couldn't say that because they weren't keeping very good records either. So I had to go by memory. Well, it, all of them pretty much are like this. So I'm just that's got to be the old version. So I put it back. And now the guy's going, not only is it not cool before what you did to it, but what you put it back to is not right either. I remember there's a certain note that I would play and it, it would make this certain sound and now it doesn't do that thing anymore. And you'd go, all right, now you have to start learning the psychology of the players and how they react to these things. And that once they notice something new and different about the amp that maybe was there originally and they didn't notice, but now they do, you, they can't unlearn that. They can't unhear that. So now you have to now you have to manage the psychology of telling them, well, you know, that was already there. You just never noticed that. And once you tell somebody that, they're like going, okay, now you're just making bullshit excuses to get out of 
that you screwed up my amp. And um, I we had that. I had a guy come in that was playing a, a double stop on his guitar, and he noticed that it started doing this sound when he played a double stop. The two notes that he played would, um, you know, they would interact with each other. And at a certain volume, the power supply starts getting a little dirty. And that that dyad that he was playing would interact with the frequency of the power supply that would call what, called what we all know now as a ghost note. And he'd never heard that ghost note in his amp before because he had never played a double stop at a certain volume at a club where he happened to notice it. So he was bringing it in, going, my amp is making this sound. He's playing a double stop, and I'm like going, I don't hear any sound. He goes, that, that, that. And I said, oh, you mean that little under, under the note? Yeah, yeah, that. I said, that was probably already there. That was always there. That's a ghost note. But what's a ghost note? Because he hadn't heard of a ghost note. We were just learning about ghost notes. I I actually start. I, I never noticed them ever until I played with the uh, uh, the Friedman <laughs> uh, small box. All of a sudden, in the small box, there's there's all these extra notes. And was it the small box? Definitely the small box. And and, and then some sometimes <laughs> they, they they pop up, and they can be horrible because they they're not in tune. Um, and sometimes they're like, I think it was a small box, like ridiculously loud and they really get in the way. Um, and I mean, I have the amps here relatively cranked because it's all going into attenuators. So mm -hmm. I'm, uh, when I actually go to like a 20 watt or five watt amp, they're extremely quiet compared to everything else. I've got the hundred watt amps probably running at like, you know, 50% volume, which is ridiculously loud, uh, which, which you would rarely do. Um, so at that, at those volumes, those notes will pop up in more mm -hmm. in more in classic amps than in modern amps, I would say. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all general, of a sudden people are starting to true. notice. Yeah. So what? So if you're having a pro, one kind of a problem that's new to you, and then that raises the your attention level to the point where you discover something new about the amp that it was that was there that you but you didn't notice. That's a new problem that they think that you have to fix. And now you're really trying to manage the psychological relationship with the customer and trying to figure out what's true, what's new, what was old, how to get the guy up to speed because all of this is Greek to them. They're just like going, what the hell's going on? I'm supposed to absorb all this stuff? Well, that's that's technological development, dude. You know, that's that's progress love, love it or hate it that's and and you're dealing with guitar players which are not easy people and we yeah. probably realistically don't really know what the amp sounded like a week ago we have an, a, a, a a romantic idea of what the amp sounded like but did it actually you know we don't really know an a b unless we literally have the old one and the new one right next to each other i and, i think no no average guitar player should feel uh, like they know less than some famous rock star because famous rock star level guitar players are just as much or more recalcitrant in, about those things than the average guy is. They're the same kind of people that are coming in going, I don't know, I just plug it in and this, and now it's doing this thing. Okay, let's identify what the thing is. Well, you can hear it. I'm hearing the amp. <laughs> which particular you know it's like it's like it must be like uh, a a handwriting expert looking at at the l in the name linda in somebody's signature and seeing that the loop at the top of the l is different on this one than on this one and that's how they figure out that 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 one is the the counterfeit signature that's the level that it's on with with some people first of all you have to figure out what it is that they're trying to tell you and then once you identify it you have to try to explain it to them that, yeah, doctor, when I do this with my arm, it hurts. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also a difference between what you feel as a guitar player, which is a lot more detailed than with what you hear. Uh, me feeling a certain thing or reacting or uh, whether it's sag or whatever, that is not necessarily something that you as a bystander can experience. Right. 
So this is the context now. We've established the context of what was going on at the time that the transition from the one to the two was going on. There was a lot more going on than we tweaked the reverb. Yeah, okay. A whole lot more. And the and from the 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 A to the B to the C, there was there was um how the effects loop worked, where the effects loop was in the circuit, and what the impedance of the effects loop was. And then there was how much uh, how much reverb in the clean channel relative to how much reverb is happening in the lead channel. And um, uh, and then how much uh, upper mids do we want to get? through the whole thing and how much of that upper mid we only want to happen in the lead channel and not in the clean channel. And we talk about channels as if it's a two channel amp, but it is a one channel amp, my friend. That's the reality of it. The only thing that's two about it is the overdrive stage dropping down on top of an existing clean channel configuration. So there's a lot of complications to that but basically what they're doing is is trying to fool the amp into behaving like it's got two independent single paths and which, the only by, time which by the way this module according to what uh, i've seen you say in a video um it, it's also not really two channels it's they're not fully independent. They are just like the original. They're, they're built on each other. So the clean volume will affect the, the, the lead volume. Or well, again, the clean gain will affect the, the, the lead gain. Most of the two-channel volumes are like that. The, the things that are really two about it are the two gains and the two master volumes. Uh, and that's true on most of them. Uh, it's a little more... Uh, it's a little more exaggerated in the 2CP because the big difference between one channel being a dedicated clean and the other being a dedicated overdrive, there's still the same channel that we're just dropping the, the overdrive circuitry on top of it, just like the original does. Uh, but the master volumes are separated better on the 2CP than they were on the original. They were more of a what you do on one affects what you do on the other affair. So <clears throat> they were a little bit harder to navigate. On the input side, the lead one and uh, uh, the the lead gain and volume one, just like on the original amp, the amount of gain that you get out of the overdrive channel is dependent on where you set volume one on the clean channel. That's the same way on the original amp. And the reason we kept it that way is because it keeps the circuit complexity down and it's more of a familiar operating mode to the people who are who are familiar with the amp. That's the way you sort of um, dialed it to fine tune how the clean channel worked and to fine tune the kind of overdrive sound that you would get. I find so I find it very interesting that you're actually saying it the way that it's on the module because I just noticed if we look at the module, it doesn't say clean gain or gain at all. It says volume one, one. and then lead drive. So that's the, the fact that you're really saying it that way means it's a very conscious decision to not say it's a clean gain, which it technically it's a channel one gain or clean gain. Uh, when you dial it, it's clearly gain. But why the decision to call that volume? Is that the way that it was on the on the original? Right. And I wanted to make sure that it was recognizable as that. So people would go, oh, this is like really the way I mine works, right? Okay. If they have if they have the real amp. We wanted to make sure that the people that were familiar with the amp would go, that's the way it, that's the way it's supposed to be. The original amp just has a row of knobs. It's, it's, it's essentially a one-channel amp where you pulled pots to mm -hmm. get it to do the other thing. It wasn't necessarily a sophisticated channel switching amp where everything was available at the foot switches. It was you had to set the pull pots a certain way, and you optimized it for your application. If you were using it mostly for overdrive or crunch sounds, you optimized it one way. You'd pull the pots. This one, this one, and this one. I don't need that one, that one, and that one. 
and, and if you were playing clean or jazzy all the time, you didn't mess with the ones over there. You left those in, but you pulled this one and this one out. And they were very application specific. So you had to kind of decide what the thing was going to be for you. And then everything else that you want to use it for, you'd either have to switch it or you'd have to find some in-between compromise setting to make it to make it do that. And um, so that would that was a skill set that you would learn using that amp. And um, but what it yielded was certain kind of personalities and 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 sonic artifacts that become part and parcel to the to the amp itself, you know, to the way it behaves. So uh, knowing how much that I I worked with players during the period of the transition from the A to the C and the C plus, which was now they're getting into little tiny capacitor changes and little subtle sort of things to optimize the gain or to improve the clean channel. Um, that's what the, the letters and the pluses and the extra plus and then the colored dots, those are just further little micro microscopic refinements that in an app like that, when you make a little tiny change, it could yield a, a pretty noticeable result. But in, in and of themselves, they were fairly minor, uh, minor little functions. Like between the plus and the plus plus, they, they sent a little less signal to the input of the overdrive stage, but allowed a little more signal to come out of the overdrive stage. So they changed the balance of the harmonic distortion coming out of the overdrive stage. Now this is this is really fine level refinement that we're talking about, and um, that's more representative what the, what the uh, the later numbers and pluses and all that uh, are relating to. So then going back in history and picking out which one was the one that really sounded great. Well, there's the 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 plus had its pluses and the plus plus you know had a little bit of a benefit too and in a way it caused a little bit of um actually the plus plus has more to do with optimizing the sound of the clean channel than the overdrive channel so the 2cp incorporates a bit of the plus and a, and a bit of the plus plus and um again it's just recognition of what these things were intended to accomplish in the amplifier and now that they're familiar to players and and um guys who are real they're they're really used to the amp they're real knowledgeable about that amp they're really loyal uh to the amp and they've got that specific model and feel that that's the best one you know try to i tried to sort of bring the the best bits of the stew uh from a couple of different variations into uh into one module and so in that respect uh, and also, it's really difficult to put pull pots on a module. So the when you say which one was the best, uh, you know, history is written by the people that use things, I guess. And which one is the the most coveted one is clearly defined by which were which was the amp played by the biggest bands who made it famous. And obviously, when we're talking about the uh 2c plus it's it's the amp that at some point hammett uh discovered and it is claimed that a lot of the metallica things were recorded with it what was really recorded uh, uh where with who who really knows but obviously the metallica sound and obviously very clearly uh petrucci uh was one of the people that made that sound famous and his amp uh actually has Two of those channels built in or something like this. Who else were some of the people that that we can say honed in on that amp and you know made d defined that sound? Well, by that time, uh and into the 90s, I really I wasn't working at Valley Arts anymore and I wasn't really focused on that. So I'm not an expert on who were later people that that used it to some specific effect like that. I know that there was uh, a lot of people that use them in conjunction with other stuff. And, um, 
you know, I mean, a lot of people used it. There's just way too many to list. Uh, who made um, an iconic record with it, a, a specific way? Gee, I don't know. I, I, probably the Metallica episode is the one that people, you know, gravitate towards because that was kind of a game changer moment for for the Mark II. And, but it, fact, it, it happened when the amp was actually not in production anymore for quite a while. Um, same, same with D Dream Theater. That, that obviously happened way later. And when the amp was being made, um, 83, 84, uh, people were clearly using it for things that we or most people wouldn't associate it with. We're associating it with this high gain, heavy sound when it can clearly do a, a whole bunch more. I mean, it's got a clean channel. Uh, it's got a very round bass tone i would say you can clearly you, know, you can play jazz with that thing and people probably very clearly did mm -hmm. yeah well there, there were um you know guys like carlos rios and larry carlton and and those kind of guys that were um you know they weren't necessarily using the eq to scoop out the mids they might have been using it to round off the top a little bit at the time that the Metallica story appears, more and more companies are gravitating away from that style of amplifier. So the things that people are really making noise with, new, new, interesting new noise with, it's not so much necessarily about that. That was kind of being left. Even the company is like going to the, the, the rectifier style thing. Everybody was moving in a different direction. So, uh, and I think the Metallica were just looking for, you know, we want to just shed our previous sonic image and go someplace else. And that amp, from my understanding, just happened to be there. And uh, somebody, they played through it and went, eh, and then somebody went like this with the EQ and put it into a Marshall cabinet and like, oh, now we're getting somewhere. So in that sense, um, it was sort of being discovered that they could push it in the direction of what contemporary development at that time was doing with new amp designs. We were on the scene making overdrive amps that have a, a big low end and a clear top end without necessarily having to have an EQ to shape it into that. Um, but there was one other company that when companies went away from the graphic EQ, there was one company that clearly jumped or kept that graphic EQ idea. And the, the company that I always associated with the graphic EQ more than actually the 2CP and that company, uh, which was your amps. That was always like, when I think of a graphic EQ, before I think of the M company, I think of VHT and later Fayette. That was always for me the company that, and now I actually know because you worked on this as a, you know, at Valley Arts, where it comes from. Right, and and that's really important to note because um, our amplifiers weren't super mid-heavy amps that needed to be scooped out to get that sound. They were designed to get that bigger, more open, punchier sound out of the gate. Uh, so once we started making that amplifier, we started getting requests for a combo version of it, a combo version of a raging half stack right how likely is it that that's going to be gonna is that that's going to happen at scale you know um to actually compete with a half stack um and the idea that a 212 combo version of of an amp that has a head and four speakers instead of two they're not that different it's actually easier to carry a head and a 412 than it is an 80 pound combo, right? Because in a 212 combo or in a 112 combo or anything less than a 412 combo, um, with all that power, you would have to have speakers that can handle that power and they, by just default, get heavier because they have bigger magnets, they have to absorb more heat, and uh, they have to take more punishment. So, it, that's really what uh, 
that's really what brought in the idea that, okay, after we get this, uh, the overdrive a certain way, after we get this, this, the amp behavior a certain way, after we get it into a 212 package, and after we're all done, the, the end result is that it still doesn't quite make it all the way to sounding like a half stack because of the sonic limitations of a 212 combo. We could seal it and it would be tighter, but it would be too tight and it would be kind of boxy. Or we leave it open back and it's going to be the, the low end is going to dissipate out the back and the likelihood of overloading the speakers on the low end is going to be higher. So there is a downside there. And how do we manage that? Well, a great way to do it would be to, to be what, what, what my mentors did previously was they came up with an EQ to, to help you dial it in to what you think is your ideal version of, of the amp. Uh, the low end characteristics or how you think it sounds more like a half stack for your particular purposes. And so to me, that EQ needed to be a little bit more flexible and um, and also work in ranges that I felt that their EQ didn't necessarily do. It's Those EQ points seemed more random to me. And there was there was, you know, Boss had an EQ pedal, and there's a few people that had MXR, uh, DOD. Lots of companies had EQ pedals out there. Uh, and the same thing, they just seemed to be sort of random and formulaic, like they were designed by engineers, they weren't designed by players. And uh, uh, I was working with uh, one, of the guys, one of the players, well-known players that I worked with a lot and really close friends with was Buzzy Feeton. And Buzzy was always experimenting with stuff that would that was meant to be used one way, and he would use it another way. He always found an innovative, unusual way to use something that was different than anybody else, because he was always exploring all these capabilities of anything that he tried. And he comes to me and he says, "Well, I have this Boss bass EQ, and it sounds better than the guitar EQ uh, for a guitar." And I went, oh, interesting. So I went and bought one, and sure enough, it it had um, it seemed to be, in my estimation, a little bit more ideally suited for what I want to hear the EQ do to my guitars. Um, but it still was, you know, weighted to the low end side of things. And then I realized what I need to do is figure out what a what a really guitar centric EQ should do and how it should behave uh, and then make that. So I got together with an audio engineer and um, that was really experienced in developing filters and understood the Q and bandwidth and all that stuff better than I did. And he also had the test equipment to be able to evaluate all the stuff which I didn't have. So I got a 36-band graphic EQ, really high-quality studio equalizer, and we went through all of the bands, and we had a bunch of guitars. We had Tellys, Les Pauls, Strats, Flying Vs. We had all kinds of guitars that had different woods, different pickups, different personalities, and played them all through this EQ and bands up and down and experiment with which ones uh which bands worked better with which guitars and we made a we made a um, a spreadsheet where we tracked all of that and we came up with a, a a grid that showed us that certain frequencies worked more ideally with not just a particular guitar but guitars in general and we realized that that was kind of, <coughs> excuse me, centered around the the body wood, the neck wood, the hardware on the guitar, the scale length, uh, the kind of pickups and the harmonics uh, therefrom, and uh, the way the tone controls worked and all that. So uh, we worked out the 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 ideal bands, and we came up, I think, with eight of them, 
and I thought eight is too many. Uh, and uh, we should we should try to reduce that down to less than eight. And um, and then this EQ here was is five and just being my contrarian self, it wasn't going to be five. It had to be one better than five. So it would be six. What, what's one better than five, hmm, mathematically? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and six is a nice even number, and seven is too much. Uh, um, when you say it, I would experiment with, okay. <clears throat> yeah, but I think you're, you're completely right. It's if you have too many, you you can destroy too much. You can you start fiddling with stuff. It's information overload. Um, it it, is. it five, is five five to six bands is I think all a guitar player can handle. And, and I always like when I talk to people about EQ. I'm not the biggest fan of. There's just the the Boss EQ 200 just came out digital thing, and you can do all these things, which is great. But a lot of graphic EQ can also mean you do too much shit because if you don't know what you're doing. Um, you can really destroy a sound. Um, for me, one of the best EQs, and I, I use this for, for vocal exclusively, for guitars exclusively, uh, also snare drum, is the Mark EQ4, where you have, uh, it's like a 500 rack unit thing, where you literally have no, uh, you have no Q, uh, you have just fixed bands and you have gain. And uh, there's a sub band but it, it starts to be interesting at 160 for me that is where a guitar is just round and the, you can dial in the body um get everything under that kind of out of the way the next band is at i think 600 something which technically for me to make a sound creamy and and beautiful it's more in the 900 range but 600 to not, anywhere there, you can really get the the singiness out of the guitar. There's a if, lot of activity in that. Yeah, range. yeah, if you want. And then the next band is at 2.5 or 3.5. That's where you get the scratchiness. Mm -hmm. And then there's an air band, which is just a high uh, high shelf, mm -hmm. which you can pick. And for, for vocals or acoustic guitar, I set that at 10. For electric guitar, I set it at 5. And I really boost the shit out of it. Um, yeah. When a lot of people, interestingly, go and get... Uh, for guitars are saying, and I always did this, which is, I think, wrong. When people are saying, well, take the high end off because it's a 12-inch speaker, it doesn't have high end, which is how as how audio engineers think about it. And you look at the EQ curves from engineers in mixing courses, something I've done in the past, they do uh, low-pass filtering because mm -hmm. there's nothing in there anyway. And I um, started to go the opposite way when I read an interview with uh, Chris Ordalgi. And Chris actually was asked, when do you use your Waves plugin? And his Waves plugin is based on his console. And he said, when on my console, I do a 5K shelf and I boost 15, I boost everything my console can do. And that's not enough for the guitars. Then I asked my guys to put my plugin on before it goes into my console and just boost more. So when 15 dB boost on the 5K isn't enough for him and he adds more, that's when I realized uh, maybe a 5K shelf is how you get guitars out of a mix. The moment I started doing that, all of a sudden, my stuff sounded better. All of a sudden, my stuff sounded... My goal was Chris Lord Algae. That was, you know, modern rock stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh... Okay, so that Mark EQ for me has, out of the box, the perfect frequencies. And if I did anything in terms of like a graphic EQ, I would literally copy those um, cues. I would copy those frequencies because it's it's absolutely perfect for guitar. You know, you want it to sing, dial this. You want more oomph, dial this. It's it's perfectly voiced. So when right, I'm looking at the um, the two CP there, that's very very much the a similar idea. Okay, well, here's the funny part. What you described is is uh, is much more applicable to the to the EQ in the ultra lead module because those frequency ranges are are more in the ballpark of what you're talking about, the actual frequency ranges. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in exploring the a, a graphic EQ and how it could be used effectively and stuff, what I learned was that you need 
a lot of boost and cut. And so we made we made it plus and minus 12 dB in the ultra lead because it needed to be that much. But that's a lot. And you could overload subsequent stages in the amps by go, going overboard with that. So you have to be careful. The next thing that I discovered when I started into the 2CP project was, uh, I mean, the reason I took it on is because we already had a, a platform with an EQ and it would make it real easy to just sort of my background knowledge of the design of the amp itself and the fact that we already had created a platform uh, on which to build the EQ into a little box that size that just made it like, do you want to do this project? Sure, I would love to do that project. So that's where that came from. In the process of that, um, I had to evaluate the frequency bands of that EQ, the five band EQ, because it's got a very signature behavior to it. It's not that it's technically a great EQ. It's just the right EQ for that. Particular yeah, you can't. You, you, it's such a classic thing. You can't deviate from that and say I can make can't it better. Be, people don't want better. People want that. I, I don't want it better. I want. I want that. I don't want yeah. it betterized. I want it <laughs> yeah. exactlyized. <laughs> To um, use your kind of lingo, because it works. That, that's, um, that is the correct technical lingo. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, and, with the and what I discovered in that was the, that the numbers on the bands that you see there, have, some of them bear little relationship to the actual frequency bands that are going on inside. <laughs> you know, don't don't tell people. Don't bands. don't don't don't. We don't talk about that. I think it's okay to talk about it because it, it still is what it is. And the main job was um, was to get it in that box. Now, now they have made uh, separate EQ boxes as accessories that you can buy. And they're if you've seen one, they're pretty big. Mm -hmm. And all of their amps that have EQs use the same EQ circuit. And if you look in them, they're they take significant circuit board space because they all use the wire wound inductors in them. And uh, uh, their head designer, who is a longtime close friend of mine, we're buddies. He's a mentor, but we're still past drinking buddies. And he is convinced that wire wound inductors cannot be duplicated using um, uh, gyrators. However, uh, to get an EQ into a package that small, you can't do it with wireline inductors. They're just, they take up too much space. And inside the housing, inside the main unit, they're, su they're susceptible to hum from the power supply, from the power transformer in the amp. And even in the real amp, if you crank the bands, they, it, you start to get hum because the inductors are picking up hum from uh, the power transformer. And in this, there was no space for wire wine inductors. And there's no chance, if we even had space for wire wine inductors, there was no chance to be able to get the full range of the boost out of them being that close to the power supply. So there's no way that it was going to be done with anything other than gyrators. So I had to spend a lot of time getting the frequency right and the bandwidth right for each band in order to do it with gyrators. So it took a long time. And when I was doing the calculations to do the conversions, I'm like going, are my calculations wrong? Because that's not what it says on there. Um, and I, I had to go back and be absolutely sure and verify, electronically verify, test it with scopes, check the frequency bands to make sure that my calculations were correct because they were all coming up a little different than what is written on the panel. And if I'm going to do this thing right and it's going to be accurate and people are going to hear it and go, yeah, that's that's how that's how it's supposed to work. It had better work that way. Yeah, so, you, you, you want to nail this. By the way, just to interject, I would like my fans to congratulate me at this moment because Stephen is talking about gyrating um, a small package and uh, the unit. And I have not once in any way 
uh, made any sexual or penis jokes about it. <laughs> just to let you know, I'm very proud of myself that I held back and let him talk. So now we got that out of the way, you know, gyrating, small package, all that, haha. Moving on to <laughs> whatever we're talking about. Well, uh, 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 thank you for thank you for loosening things up. Yeah, because all that stuff does get pretty dry and boring. Uh, but but sometimes. the people that that are interested in this in this in this module, um, my friend Bernd Kiltz, a uh, guitar teacher here in Germany, he's got a great YouTube channel, amazing guitar player. He's a huge fan of the two C two uh, CP. Um, he has the JP two C whatever the Petrucci thing. He's a big Petrucci fan. He is. He doesn't want to keep it because of the new owners of the company. He doesn't want to support what they do. And he wants to sell that amp, but he wants that sound. So he is dying to know if this module can get him the sound that, that he craves. He's writing me, can you do this? Can you do these settings? Um, uh, he wants to invest in the Synergy to, to get that that module. And I'm pretty sure that that module might be what some people have been waiting for. So um, I got a couple of questions. Primarily, we know there is a 2CP version without EQ. Do you personally think that that makes sense? Do you think that that is the same amp if you take the EQ out? Because I feel that the sounds that it is known for, Metallica, whatever, it, you... I feel that you can't get those if you don't have the EQ. Or am I seeing that wrong? If you go back in time and look at the EQ as an accessory rather than a key part of the sound, uh, you certainly can get all kinds of really interesting, great sounds uh, out of it with the EQ off. That said, all the various ways that you could use that amp and by extension this module are available to you uh, you know, in this day and age, and frankly, uh, I evaluated the JP2C. I'm going to ruffle some feathers a little bit and go, say go, go, that go right ahead, Ruff, that ruffle, just, ruffle away. I just feel like I just feel like um, the JP2C was is their kind of effort to go back and capture some of the magic of the 2C plus and. Uh, and maybe bring it into the present day, and then they've got a very powerful artist to help, you know, to help raise the awareness of that agenda. All good, great. Some things have happened in technology, you know, over the over the period of time that allow that that allow you to sort of cram more features and more functions into that, uh, you know, into that little package space. Um, that m allows for the artist to say all of that, plus I would like X, Y, and Z in there as well. And they um, obviously made the effort to accomplish that, like with having two EQs and so on. There's actually, a, if I recall correctly, I think there's three EQs in there. There's the two that you have access to on the front panel, and then there's a third one inside that's preset to a specific curve. So even they recognize that there's sort of like a signature recognizable curve that everybody's used that EQ for, and that that's an important component of their sound to the extent that they built it out inside as a separate function that you can just access on the fly. You don't have to set it manually. You just turn it on. Marshall did a similar kind of a thing um, on one of their preamps. Was it the MP1? I'm not sure. I don't exactly recall. But um, in addition to the tone controls, I think it was the JMP1. And I think the treble, middle, and bass uh, are digitally derived. So they're filters. They're not like a classic tone stack. So how they approached that was they took the original Marshall tone stack and set it to the positions that everybody knows the amp for, that everybody sort of sets it for that kind of sound, they preset a tone stack inside the MP1 to achieve that curve and put it in the signal path. I, I mean, it makes so, sense if it's, especially with a, a 2CP, if it's if there's a certain kind of, you know, V that people just 
do to get that Metallica, whatever, rhythm sound, and that's all they do, then I technically just need a switch to turn that on because I'll never actually fiddle with the EQ. If you fiddle with the EQ, put it there. My, my only gripe with the uh, JP2C is it's an amp that's clearly made, and it's a signature amp, so it, it fits someone's wishes, but it's a signature amp for someone who plays live, who wants the same channel twice, um, and wants them set up slightly differently. Maybe it's just volume or lead rhythm, whatever. Me, from my personal point of view, me as a studio player, um, it feels like I'm spending a lot of money on something I really don't need because what I'm getting is I'm getting the same same channel twice. Whereas what I do in the studio is I, I just set it up differently. I don't need that yeah. extra channel, which means for life, absolutely. You love the sound of that channel, you want two settings. In a studio, it'll be totally enough to have it once and I just change the setting from one part to the other. So I, I would feel I'm spending a lot, I'm spending a third of the money on an extra channel that in the studio I don't need because I can achieve it by changing the setting. In a yep. life, it's yep. complete. You're buying a three-channel amp that doubles the one channel plus a little bit more gain, which I could probably get with a boost. So I feel a lot of money is being spent by the Petrucci fans on something that if they only play it at home, you don't really need. But that's that, a very personal point of view. That, and there's two key things going on here. Number one is that the original amp that this module is based on being an ongoing sort of work in progress, a lot of unusual layout decisions are made inside it to just get it to work without misfiring, without misbehaving, uh, you know, keeping it functional, but getting the job done and getting on to the next thing. Uh, so layout and and relationship of components to each other inside the circuitry is critical to the behavior of the module in order to recreate that. So that attention was paid to that detail in that thing. In the newer models of the amps, they've come up with, like you say, innovative ways to get still the same basic amp. Maybe they've added an additional triode so that they can have uh, easier access to some of the the switchable functions that 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 newer model has uh, but for the most part it's still the same amp and all the switchable functions and all the additional knobs in there are controlled by relays that just turn them on and off but the still that's at the very root of it the heart of the amplifier is the same it's that same little uh you know it's that same little construction of the clean channel with the overdrive stage dropped in on top of it, like a helicopter dropping a box in a yard. It's just like, boom, here's the overdrive. And all the stuff that goes on with making the overdrive work in an environment like that is, is, uh, revolves around, uh, making sure that it doesn't feedback, making sure that it doesn't self oscillate, making sure that it doesn't get too noisy, making sure that it doesn't pick up noise from uh, the power supply area of the inside the chassis. There's like, all these things like, we need to get this overdrive to work in probably about the most hostile environment that we have could possibly create for an, a high gain two stage preamp section like that to exist. A lot of it is just, is, is, um, is band-aiding the thing so that it operates correctly. And um, so myself, learning from experiences like that, that led me to working out size and space and layout and com intercomponent relationships in order to get maximum performance without having to constrain performance because of the environment. We didn't make a chassis really, really tiny and then jam it full every every square millimeter of area inside the chassis having stuff in it there was room to breathe so that you could make things work properly without having to constrain their performance but in in that amplifier that little environment with all the stuff that goes on in there there's a lot of stuff 
and they those all those stages and, and all those bringing the controls out to the front panel and the wiring that it takes to get it there all that stuff becomes subject to uh, internal, you know, feedback and crosstalk and all those kinds of things. That just exponentially complicates the design process and by extension has to affect um, the behavior of the circuitry uh, in a detrimental way. And you have to go figure out a way to undo that or fix that or modulate that so that it does operate the way you want it to. So that a, you, a lot of compromises are made. And in that respect, the module is actually more sensibly laid out than the original amp, but the component relationships are very close. And the things that were done to get it to get that sort of signature sound uh, were taken into serious consideration so that it would do that. The, the, the distinctive mid-range characteristic and all that. Um, those, those kind of things were all taken very much into account. Uh, the EQ, whether it was in the circuit or not in the circuit, of, was not of that much consequence. Uh, although you could overload um, the EQ if you turn the master volume up high enough. So in the original amp, if you ordered it with the EQ, the solid state EQ circuitry is in the signal path between the master volume and the power amp. But there are also some signal losses between the output of the EQ and the power amp because of their effects loop, which is never very well designed effects loop. So there's frequency losses and level losses going through the effects loop. It's not an ideally uh, configured effects loop circuitry. So that's impacting the whole stew as well. Then, of course, you would have been able to order the amp without the EQ, and then you wouldn't have that solid state circuitry in there, which is in the circuit path, whether or not the EQ is operating. The switch that turns off the EQ doesn't remove it from the signal path. It just, it, it just turns off its operation in the real amp. In the module, it bypasses most of it. it the buffers stay but all of the all of the circuitry that involves the, the the sliders and stuff are switched out and um the reason for that is because in the base unit of of the the sin one the sin two the sin 30 and the sin 50 um those amplifiers uh are all outside of that environment and they're sufficiently buffered away from the actual operating circuitry of the module that um, you have a little bit more leeway to get things to work right. Um, but you also want to keep things consistent between when the EQ is on and the EQ is off. So in the in the 2CP module, like in the ultra lead module, the EQ is the last thing in the circuitry and the buffer between the analog circuitry and the EQ circuitry stays in place so that it um, so that whether it's on or off, the master volumes still operate the same way. They behave the same way. You don't want to turn the EQ off and then find out that you have to change the master volumes to different settings because they they sound different at different settings. You need to have that consistent. And that was a key part of being able to put that circuitry in a little module was that we don't want to upset the behavior of the unit when the EQ is turned off. We want to have that consistency. We want to have the sound there. If you like the sound of it with the EQ off, we don't want to damage that by having their behavior change when you put the EQ on. I so mean, I, I only um, played it, I got to say, for about 10 minutes so far. Um, but you're fully right. You turn the EQ on, and then you can sculpt your sound. But it does. There's no major bump in in level or anything. It just it stays. It it's you can shape the sound, but you don't have to completely change everything else. Uh, it's it, it it's easy to handle when the EQ is on. And I think that the, between the way the circuit is laid out, the 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 attention to detail uh, and the adherence to the original design to get its signature voicing to happen is the most important thing. And it's there so that 
when you are experimenting, exploring the module, you'll get this. You'll get very similar results to exploring the real amp because the whole idea was it is it is sort of complex in its simplicity and there's a lot of ins and outs to getting certain things to work right and so you're going to tweak it and screw around with it and you're going to discover things that oh i can do this i didn't realize i could do that um you're going to you're going to find a lot of stuff to like in there and you're going to just like on the real one you're going to find stuff to hate this and, is not i mean um, in general with the with with any amp from the m company <laughs> my original approach is always i play it any any of those amps and i think it's horrible uh i mean every time i sit on a rectifier i'm like what the crap is this um i had a a, a, a mark 525 a great amp but oh my god what is there's a lot of shitty sounds in the beginning until you those are amps you have to learn and i feel the the module is the same thing. Uh, looking at your video where you're explaining it, I feel that people going to a store, oh, let me pop that module in. I think the, the, the salespeople in stores really need to be trained. Or they have to be customers that actually know the original amp. But just fiddling with it without actually knowing, for example, that a volume one will be actually affecting gain on the lead channel, um, how the presence works, all these things... There's a lot of ins and outs you have to know. One thing I found really interesting is you talking about impedance mismatching, um, where the original amp didn't have a 16 ohm out, but people clearly used it with 412 with 16 ohm, and they just plugged it into the 8, and that mismatching resulted in a bump in the uh, in the mid okay. that was very characteristic. So in order to achieve that you'd literally have to do that mismatching with the synergy as well. It's not So Hen Henning's talking about a video that I did to help guys like him and the other people that are I, doing I do need the help. Everybody does. I do. Uh, and the reason I brought it up is because if you want, so I made this video for all the guys to sort of un understand the basic ins and outs of this module and how to present it and and what funny little things it does. If you watch that video carefully, you'll see that I'm doing that while I'm demonstrating. I'm going, okay, here's that big chunky. Oh, it's actually not that chunky. Oh, now it's chunky. Okay, here's that chunky sound. I do that. Even, even though I built it, designed it, uh, vetted it out, and played it and played it and played it. When it came time to demo it, I did find myself going, oh, I need to get this, I need to get this. Oh, there it is, there's the sound that I wanted the guys to see it do. Um, because in that context, things maybe had changed. Maybe I was playing it at a different volume. Uh, maybe it was just a different day, who knows what. But then on top of that, I had to remember, oh, you know, guys, here's an important thing that we need to talk about that nobody is, would be talking about initially and are likely to overlook even if you do talk about it, which is that the original amp only had a four ohm and eight ohm output or two four ohm and one eight ohm output. There was three, but it wasn't four eight and 16. It was four four and eight or four eight and eight. I think it was four four and eight. So there was no 16 ohm output on that. So when you plugged it into a Marshall cab, which is which was part of the the uh, the Metallica revelation with the Mark amp um, and turning on the EQ was that oh we got the sound this is the sound we really like the sound that they got that they really like was through a Marshall cabinet that was a 16 ohm cab plugged into an 8 ohm amp and not being technicians the guitar players and studio engineers are not necessarily all that sharp on stuff like this either. Uh, they would just go, that's a good sound, stick a mic in front of it, let's capture it, boom, we're done. Uh, but what's actually happening is there's an impedance mismatch going on there, and that affects the mid-range behavior of the amplifier. So if you really want to nail this particular signature sort of howling mid-range is sort of a hollow mid-range some people call it haunting mids whatever you want to call it there's a way to arrive at it but it isn't necessarily tied up into the module which is the preamp stage it's a function of the power amp and it and it points to how important it is to pair it with the right power amp in order to get it to sound the way you would like it to sound 
and it just so happens that that uh, while I was making that demo video, I I I went, oh yeah, I got to make sure I cover that, and I was using the power station power amp to demonstrate. You were using the two, right? App. Because the the the, the hundreds got KT somethings. And the two's got six L sixes. Is that is that correct? The hundred's got sixty five fifties. Yeah, and the two's got six L sixes. Okay, so but functionally they're very similar as far as frequency response and all that. So they're they're functionally the same. Although I use the PS just because it's there. I use it for testing all day long on a lot of different things, and so I use the 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 the, the PS two, which has the six L sixes and it's fifty watts. But same thing. The same thing occurs with the PS100 or any four tube 6L6 amp that you set to eight ohms and then plug it into a 412 cap, which is the low mids are gonna shift up. And of course, if we start talking about that, then we're gonna start having to talk about, but a mismatch and a mismatch and my blow, blow my output transformer and damage and fear and flames and woo. and um, that is also a misconception about how how mismatching and the dangers of of operating your amp in such a way that you would damage the output transformer actually work. So people don't understand that, and so they're going to have a little bit of a trepidation going into mismatching their amp because they've heard so much misinformation about it. And the key important thing about that misinformation is is it's really overblown. You'll see on a forum where somebody says, I turned on my amp and I forgot that I didn't have the speaker cabinet connected. Did I blow my output transformer? And the answer is, is it still working? Well, yeah. Well, then, then, you, then you didn't. Happens you to, didn't. It happens to me. I mean, operating? then you didn't blow your engine. You know, are you still going 60 miles an hour? You didn't blow your engine. But people don't understand what damage my output transformer means. They don't know, they haven't experienced that, so they don't know what those terms mean. So anyway, um, you can operate an amplifier into a mismatch impedance. You don't want to operate into no load when you're playing the amp pretty much turned all the way up, you know, at full volume with no speaker connected. If your amplifier speaker jack doesn't short when you disconnect it some of them do some of them don't it's good that it shorts when you don't plug it in because that represents a load to the output transformer and protects it but really you have to work very very hard to blow an output transformer that way and what i mean by that is you have to crank up the amp and blast away with the speaker cable plugged into the amp but not plugged into the cabinet just laying on the floor that's no load and you have to blast into it pretty hard for a while in order to get it to blow up doing that. Just playing at an average volume uh, into a mismatch load is going to do nothing but shift the relationship of the frequency power and frequency response to the load impedance. That's all you're really And, and you get a different volume, right? And you get a, a, a bit, yeah, yeah. That's uh, in, in the um, Ampete manuals. Because of course people are worried about putting different amps into the impede switches. There's a whole section about impedance, and Peter Arns always goes like, "Yeah, it's really not anything we should worry about, um, un unless, as you're saying, you're taking every one of your hundred, hundred, hundred fifty watt amps and you're cranking it up." Or who who does that? I mean, unless you're playing a, a super vintage hundred watt plexi and you really want to get it to the very, uh, but I mean, who does that? I'll tell you who does that. You're in a recording studio with a head and a 412 cab, and it's in the studio, and you got it dime. And uh, you're recording tracks, and you lay one down, and then you lay another one down, and then you lay another one down, and then okay, we're gonna try, we're gonna try the next rhythm track. So this is gonna be track seven of the rhythm track. Ready, one, two, three, go. He plays the chord, nothing comes out of it. They all stop, and they go, oh, there's no sound. Huh, it's real quiet in there. Let's go check and see what's going on. Oh, your amp blew a fuse. Uh, let's put another fuse in. You put a fuse in, and then it blows the fuse again. And like, oh, what happened? And uh, then you put in another fuse, and then you plug the amp into another cabinet, but 
the fuse blows again. And like, okay, what's going on there? Must be something wrong with the amp. So you plug a different amp into the different cabinet and you get sound. You go, okay, so let's just plug, it was the amp that failed. So let's just plug that amp into the cabinet that we already had mic'd up so we don't have to move the mics and away we go. You plug it into the cabinet, there's no sound. What happened is you were blasting away, having fun, carving tracks, and then you blew the speakers in the, in the, in the amp, in the cabinet. You blew the speakers in the cabinet and didn't realize it. And then you kept playing at full volume, trying to figure out where the sound wasn't coming out. And then you blew the output transformer. That's the kind of work that it takes to really damage an amp in that way. And yeah, but wouldn't, I, only, uh, 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 wouldn't only idiots do that? You're assuming that a guy that can operate a 64 input console and make beautiful music come out of it is automatically technically proficient in all this other stuff. And I'm here to tell you, they don't. Uh, they I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that I would even with with the recording student, and I have I have seven massive ISO caps in the basement. I've got an ISO cap for an X, XL four twelve if I want to. Big ass boxes I can put in to get get those speakers out of the way and mic them. Even then. I would never come up with the idea to diamond amp. Uh, it would never even occur to me. It's not not even a classic -y amp that you know sounds great when you're. It just it. I would think to myself, that's gonna break something. But that's it's just me. It's, that's just me. It's an emotional thing in the heat of creative creating music in 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 the in the heat of creation you've got momentum you've got inertia going on you've got excitement you've got oh i just let we got to capture this magic moment you know that's where everybody's attention is focused they're not thinking about impedances or 35 milliamps of bias current. they're not <laughs> thinking that they're thinking get that performance that magic bit get that that's going to be gold that's what they're focusing on and you have the luxury of knowing you're a total environment inside and out and what you're trying to do. I have a customer who's going, I'm so in love with the power station. I took my 1969 JMP and full right hand sweeped it. And I was having so I was much just going to say, we have a tool playing. nowadays that can get you that sound without killing the speaker and without killing your ears. You still yeah, obviously want to have the speaker happens. pumping that's at a certain volume. But in not the heat insane. Of the moment, in the emotion of the moment, what's happening is you're going, this is blowing my mind how much fun I'm having and how great this sounds. And I've never been able to get that at this volume and blah, 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 bang, 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 bang. And then boom, it stops because looks at his watch. I have been right hand sweep jamming my 69 Marshall into the attenuator for four straight hours. And the output transformer finally gave up. I thought you said that power attenuators weren't supposed to do that. And and my answer is, you would have done that if you had a cabinet, a 412 cabinet in your basement isolated like, like you do, where you're not directly face to face with the consequences of doing that. You would have blown the amp doing it that way as well. You abused the crap out of your amp it was fun it was exciting it was inspiring it was emotional you like when i've i've realized that i can get the sound in my head that's been in there for all these years and now i'm finally doing it and poof you know it's just the excitement of the moment takes over and well, it, you, you can't do it it just costs you money it just costs you get a new get a new transformer get a new cap um you know hey you, you had fun and it cost you something that's right. <laughs> now let's get back to the module. I have a couple more questions. Now, given okay. you said obviously the um, the power amp is important, so given the fact that the original amp had six L sixes and that the whole synergy system is built with their power amps around six L six, whether it's the Syn fifty fifty uh, or in the Syn fifty, I know it's uh, it's all six L six. So the two CP naturally is a good pairing with the synergy system because you're putting it in that environment. I mean, how much does a power amp tube type change the sound? Uh, 
yeah, we can discuss that. But the thing is, the original had 606s, Synergy's got 606s, so technically we should get very close. In in terms of, you are a connoisseur of that sound. You were there from the very beginning. You serviced them. You know exactly what you're looking for. So I would consider you being very picky when it comes to how how close it gets. In your estimation, how close does it get to the original 112 combo? Well, we had uh, a few around. And uh, so we had it all set up with an AB setup. And the only real well way to tell if you've got something that you want to hear difference you have to switch it on the fly immediately. There can't be any delay between A and B. Absolutely. Otherwise, your ear adjusts immediately, or you forget within seconds what it sounded like. You have to within go back seconds, and forth. Less than 10 seconds of downtime between A and B, yeah. anything can happen. And There's no, let's unplug this and plug this in like you would do at a guitar store. You completely forgot what you just played. The only way to do this, and and I've realized that when I got the Ampede switches, that's how you do an AB. That's the only way to do it. Playing something and then unplugging and plugging into something else for three seconds. And in that three seconds, a dog barked. That erases your baseline instantaneously. And you have to, and then your brain has to sort of recreate that, and it'll do so inaccurately. You have to switch instantaneously to really evaluate, and that's we had a setup like that to the point where we would have people come in and do blind tests, and they would say, "Yeah, the original sounds much better," or "The original sounds just like it, except uh, the one that you made uh, sounds a little bit more refined, or something like that." And they're what they're describing are the opposite things. They're actually saying that the that the the module is the one that sounds like the original, and the original sounds like what they wish the uh, you know. You, I wish you could make the module sound like that. You're listening to the module. Oh, wait a minute, switch it again. And a lot of those conversations, it is really it's way closer than it has any right to be given the packaging and the limitations of the whole system. I mean, by just by its very nature, the module is not going to encompass every single stage and every single bit of what's going on inside the head. So to ask it to be, you know, dead on identical is really a stretch. And, you know, everybody would have to understand that that's not going to be the case. That's not going to be possible. What is possible, though, is to get it so close that with the right cabinet and the right uh, the right power amp, anybody that comes up to you and says that you don't have that sound or or something so close to it that I like it, I it's almost perfect or it's actually a little better than perfect. That's that to me, I think, is really the accomplishment of the unit. Now, as far as different power amps. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to dispel more uh, voodoo about power tubes and how they sound. It's not the it the the yes six L sixes have a slightly different sonic characteristic than EL thirty fours, but the only way you can actually experience that is to have one amplifier that has a phase inverter that is optimized for the 6L6 and a phase inverter that's optimized for EL34s and have those two driving EL34s with identical transformers, except the transformers have to be, one has to be optimized for the EL34s and the other one has to be optimized for 6L6 operation and then run those a switching system that you can run those both into the identical cabinet. And then once you do that, you will play one, switch it, play the other one, and you'll go back and forth about 50 times, and then you're going to start to go, which one is the EL34 again? Which one is the 6L6 again? I've lost track, because you will. Their differences are that subtle. What's 
not subtle in the differences of different power amps is how the output transformer is designed, what the plate voltages are, what the headroom of the phase inverter stage is, and what type of phase inverter is it? Is this at a concertina? Is it a long tail pair? Is it, um, is it, um, a split load phase inverter feeding uh, a a voltage amplifier or a unity gain buffer uh, to extend its impedance so that it doesn't get loaded down by the grids of the power tubes. Is it any of those things? And all of those are way, way more significant in terms of difference of behavior and sound than the difference in the actual behavior between an EL34 and an E6L6. So, but people love uh, to discuss it on forums forever, and and then there's the EVH amp with the oh my god now we've got the EVH with 34s, and then you have to buy that even though you have the other one. I mean, it's it it sells stuff. Marketing loves those kind of dichotomies because they're unresolvable because there's too many people that that are they're hung up on the dogma. They're and we talk about this on our malcontent show all the time about the canon the book the big book in the sky that says this is how everything is and you have to adhere to the book and the truth is is there is no book there is no rule there are so many different platforms out there that operate different ways for different reasons that you can't there isn't a rule all there is is your your finite experience at the time your experience and it does that work for you and if not then you keep exploring until you find what does work for you given all that there are um i've used this the 2cp with um our 6l6 power amp our 6550 power amp our kt88 power amp our el34 power amp uh the original power amp stage uh, in the one of the amps that we used as a reference to recreate the preamp section and uh, and a number of others and a solid state one and going direct into a console through IRs and all kinds of stuff. And the best that you can ask a piece of equipment like this to do and perform in a wide variety of ver uh, environments like that is pretty damn nailed it well you know? there's there's also the um obviously if you have a, an amp where the power amp tubes become more important for sound shaping because you're actually using it for for, for driving like like a plexi um i yeah. think they have much bigger role than an amp especially like the synergy system or probably the the original two where the sounds being created in the preamp and then you're kind of just making it loud um, as far as and in that context, in that context, the the two CP actually gives you way more possibilities than the original amp because you can you can attach it to these other devices and get them to do those things and create new combinations of sounds with it. So it actually extends the palette. It's not really necessarily just it's this palette and it's only this palette and you are required to use it this way. It's actually a way to take that basic platform and expand upon it and create, and, and create your own your own palette like right. for me there are certain modules that lend them or certain amp types that lend themselves better to the synergy system than others like mm -hmm. um a plexi when we go there obviously uh, back in the day there was people cranked up the amp so power amp tubes had a lot to say in terms of how the sound was shaped because they were driving too um, um right yeah. So so having a, a plexi module where all of a sudden that is trying we're trying to recreate that in the preamp um, is more difficult. Whereas uh, if you take a Friedman module, uh, uh, as far as I understand, Dave does almost everything in the preamp and then the amp makes it loud. Um, for me, the one amp that's difficult to recreate, whether it's in a pedal or in a module, is for example the Dirty Shirley. Because it's the one Friedman amp that's got different tubes. It's got the 58, 80 somethings. I don't know things. Um, and there's some kind of low end uh, woompiness that you can't really recreate with module into 6L6. It might be other things too. I don't know what that is. It's not something really that the pedal can recreate. Everything else on the Friedman side that is recreatable 
because the sound is being done in, in the preamp. And I think with the 2CP, that's what's happening here. Uh, whether you pump that into your 6L6 or into your whatever, um, you can get to where the original was. I always, and I, do, I don't know why that is, but I always say for me, the Synergy system opened up and really revealed itself once I had the Syn 50. And you designed those power amps, right? So, um, when I designed I, the, the Syn 50, the Syn 50 50 power amp. I didn't design the heads or combo. But that's that's the thing for me when I had the the, the system first. I had the Syn 50 50, 212 cap, and I think the Syn 1. And I think the Syn 2 as well. But I was playing it and I was like, okay, um, nice. But it didn't kind of blow me away. And then I got the Syn 50, and all of a sudden I'm like, ah, that makes sense to me. But that can't possibly be that the 5050 and the head are so drastically different in their in their power amp that I would feel that way. Was that a psychological thing because I was looking at a one one piece rack unit? I mean, what what happened there in in my um perception of the system that all of a sudden in the Sin 50 it was like, oh, that's better. Well, in the in the head and especially in the combo, now you're configuring the power amp stage for a specific, a more specific application. Especially in the case of the combo, you got the speaker that's in the combo. You have the size of the combo cabinet, and the behavior of the power amp has to be complementary to that. So it's by necessity going to be a little bit more dialed in. Um, and if I'm if if I'm recalling correctly, I believe the uh, the phase inverter in the SYN50 head and in the SYN30 combo is different than the phase inverter in the power amp. Now, the reason for that is that those are supposed to be more expressive in and of themselves, where the power amp, uh, the philosophy behind the power amp is that it's going to be a little bit more neutral and that it has a more dialability to be able to tweak it differently for different, all the possible different modules that you might use it with and all the different cabinets that you might use it with. So that's another sort of layer of exploration that you would have to do to try to find, as far as what works for you, to find the right speaker cabinet and the right settings on the power amp to go with the the uh, the, the SYN uh, modular system, you know, the SYN 1 or the SYN 2. Um, and that's just another, that's just another can of worms. They all have their personality hacks that you have to get around. Uh, our LX2 power amp works a little differently than the SYN 5050. It's a little bit more open, uh, and it has less, um, the, the output transformers are a little different and it uses less feedback. And so it's a little bit more open of a platform and it lends itself more to what I like to hear more out of the modules, whereas the um, the the Syn fifty fifty just by design they wanted it to be they wanted the presence and depth controls to be more active. Making them more active means that there are playing positions where it might not necessarily um, uh, be conducive to getting the sound you want at that particular moment. You have to play around with it a little more to get it to dial in, and uh, and maybe maybe your speaker choice could have something to do with that. Um, yeah, people but, forget people forget that speaker choice is, I would say, fifty to maybe sixty percent of the frequency response is speaker choice. You know, fiddle around with the EQ all you want, change the speaker once, bam, your sound changes drastically. People really oftentimes forget that. That people people look at speaker graphs online and go, I want a speaker that has that graph. <laughs> or they look at an impedance curve uh, drawing online and go, I want a speaker that has that impedance curve. And they don't understand what any of that means. Um, but what it means is that you're looking at a graph that's generated by a very low impedance sort of uh, a laboratory solid state power amplifier that's designed 
to be absolutely 100% flat neutral puts nothing into the signal path whatsoever that you didn't put into the input. And the, the low output impedance is very important. It's not like matching four, eight or 16 ohms out of a solid state power amp into a speaker. This, the, the solid state power amp has a nominal impedance that it operates most efficiently at. And if you look at the specs for solid state power amps, you see that they put out more power at the lower impedances and less at the high impedances. But the frequency response doesn't really change. Uh, and so what's going on in there is that the lower the impedance of speakers that you're driving, the more power you'll get out of the amp. But in testing the speaker, we're not caring about that. What we're caring about is extracting the base performance out of the speaker so that we can observe, analyze, and compare that as engineers, what the speaker actually does. So we want to test every single speaker using the same formatting for testing, a testing standard that we can compare everything to. So, so just just to bottom, bottom line what you just said, because I zoned out when you talked about impedance and I, the people that look at a frequency response curve online and buy a cab based on that are super nerds and they probably have never recorded anything in their lives. I'm sorry, because that has literally nothing to do with making freaking music. Use Play a speaker, use your ears, and even then, you don't know what's going to happen with wh what you like in the room, but how does that translate into a recording with an SM57 and then some EQ that some engineer is going to put on later? There's there's so much to the signal that that goes on a recording, uh, but looking at a graph online and that that's for nerds like Steven to look at, not for guitar players. I mean, come on, people. I, I well, that that's that's people looking for answers to their questions, you know, because uh, because also what happens when you get to the gig? All bets are off. All bets are off. And in, in a live situation, most 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 certainly. Um, and in multiple live situations, everything is going to be different, you know. And I think people want to just sort of like, how do I get everything to stay the same all the time? And that you're never gonna, that's never gonna happen. Well, we we kind of have to bring this to a close um, because I also want to uh, ask even about something else for a different video. But um, I'm going to say this was a very very intimate look at the history of the marks from someone who actually was involved in the evolution and then years later you know put it in a very very small i mean look look how tiny it is this is a very tiny package which is one of the things i would criticize which Stephen has no control over synergy has no control over those modules are tiny and putting a five band eq on it means you need a smurf to operate it but there's, there's literally nothing you can do about it because it's just the way that the modules are. They are small, and if you want to operate that EQ, look at my finger. I mean, it is, it obviously on the travel of the slider, you make per distance bigger changes than on a big EQ. So you're going to have to be very careful. Wait, do these have... No, they don't. Um, they don't have we little tried, We tried to get, we have tried desperately to get little sliders like that that have center detents, and we have been unable to find them. And and uh, I will admit that that the, the practical application of the EQ aside, the big attraction of being able to put the EQ, which a lot of people associate with the importance of the ultra lead, you know, it's not the ultra lead without the EQ. Well, it is, but to a lot of people, it's not. So we had to, uh, it was sort of like a challenge to me to get that in there. And the joke around the company was that you're just crazy enough to try to get all that performance and flexibility in that little box. Nobody else would even bother for a lot of the reasons you said. It's not practical. The sliders are going to be small uh, and so on and so forth. There are going to be some compromises. But the fact is that it works and it works well. 90% of the people would go and bit, set it up one way. It requires it requires a, some attention on the part of the player. You have to get in there with your Smurf fingers and, and, 
yeah, the, all that's true. Um, but um, well, the, it, it, most the people will go and set it up once. Off. Most people will set up their VR, whatever. I always think studio where. You know, yeah. for certain application, I go and change it, which is not very likely. Something I might actually do, and I wasn't looking for a center detent. Um, you, you can only put in what the market offers. And right now, the market with Corona offers very little. Um, <laughs> I was looking for a little notch in the middle of the slider where I could get in with my fingernail and then move it back and forth. Mm, yeah, yeah. But that is something um, I could literally do with a nail file. So if I wanted to, I could actually just are these metal or are those plastic? They're they're plastic. So yeah, you can do that. Just a little bit of a file, be, because then I don't put my whole finger on it. I can actually put my nail in it, and I think that might make it a little bit easier. That's a little bit of a tip for the people that want to ruin the warranty on their two CP module. I've come up with a little a little thing where I put the slider in between my fingernail and my finger, and I run it that way. <laughs> or hire a Smurf to operate your module. Yeah. Um, Sieben, thank uh, you so yeah, much for your time. Sense, it was just the temptation or the, 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 the challenge or temptation to get all of that in that little box overrode the, the practical side of it for me. It was just like, I'm going to do this. Oh, and, it, uh, it's, it's amazing what what is in one of those modules and imagine you've got a <laughs> imagine you've got a, a sin 2 or a sin 50 and you're putting that thing in there you're putting an ultra lead in there or a deliverance um or one of those bogner modules e each of those two channels so many options compared to the the earlier modules modules which were rather basic but all the switches i mean you could have an os module and then you have literally you have the you have a two cp two channels two channels um and a two-channel dumbbell style thing in in one app. I mean, would you ever need that? I don't know, but you could. <laughs> um, and having an ultra lead and a 2CP, and the 2CP is giving you your rhythm and you go to the ultra lead where on that EQ you have the mids boosted and you have that ridiculous lead sound. Um, that's now possible. And it's possible for, if you get the Sin 50, put these two in there, under two and a half thousand bucks. That's ridiculous. So um, we got to we will shut this down now. Thank you so much for your time. Um, whoever you watched until now is a serious, serious nerd and is seriously interested in this module. Obviously, there's a full review of the module in a separate video. I was going to put this in the review video, but that's not going to happen because we're over two hours. <laughs> um, look, you guys watched it. That's your fault. You nerds. Um, <laughs> just like this man over there. Um, thank you so much. And uh, we're going to put... Uh, things at the end that we always put at the end things well thank thank you for the opportunity to talk about that i always enjoy talking to you and i always enjoy talking ad, ad nauseum about gear and the subtlety of things and uh that won't change you're a so. techno gear amp nerd of the highest <laughs> yeah. order from from day one literally well thank you so much and we're going to put uh, enjoy it a lot thank you animals at the end Gotta go. Who's to blame in this game? Light of flame and let it glow. On the base full of rage, we engage the imposter god. Those fall righteous, try to make the cross, and then the.